Welcome to Mrs. True Crime. Today's video is an in-depth look into the gruesome killing spree of Raya and Sakina bint Ali al-Hamam. It's a tale of greed and heartlessness. If you're triggered by anything dealing with death, feel free to click off this video. Perhaps check out a puppy video for some lighthearted content. If not, I'm Nicole. Let's get started. According to deathpenaltyinfo.org, the first established death penalty laws developed in 18th century BC in the code of King Hammurabi of Babylon. The code consisted of 282 rules written in if-then form and cited the death penalty for 25 different crimes, such as, if anyone is committing a robbery and is caught, then he shall be put to death. By 16th century AD, Britain had experimented with many different forms of capital punishment, such as burning at the stake, hanging, and beheading. The variety of deathly actions and reasons for such heavily influenced America, and the first recorded execution was Captain George Kendall in Jamestown in 1608, his crime being a spy for Spain. Women executions were a bit different. As told by CapitalPunishmentUK.org, women often suffered the death penalty for the murder of their illegitimate children. As hanging was the method of choice into the electric chair in 1890, the first woman hung was Jane Champion in 1632 in Virginia. She was charged with murder and concealment of her illegitimate child. Her lover, William Gallopin, was also charged, but it's unclear if he was also executed. But capital punishment is not secluded to America. In 2017, 23 countries carried out 993 executions according to telegraph.co.uk. Coming in at the bottom of the list is Pakistan with 60, Egypt with 35, Somalia 24, and USA with 23. Though some countries have adopted new ways of execution, Egypt continues to use hanging. It was their method of choice when Raya and Sakina, the first woman executed in Egypt, died in 1921. Egyptian journalist Fikri Abaza once wrote, Where are the police? Where is the sword of government that shall fall on the necks of bloodthirsty criminals? Where is the vigilant eye of justice that should never wink? Where is the mighty hand of authority? Answering his own questions, he said, Indeed, the government has been too intent upon training the hordes of its secret political police to concern itself with training forces necessary to safeguard our internal security or personal safety. It is time for us to ask it to address the dangers posed by that negligence. The recent murders are a great calamity, the horrors of which have blackened the forehead of the 20th century. Under the control of the British, middle-class urban elites sought to regain their country back. Instead, though occupying authority positions, main governmental control rested with the King of Egypt and the British. This disadvantage birthed the Waft political party and other revolution of movements, leaving sisters Raya and Sakina to their crimes undetected. Little is known about Raya and Sakina's childhood, but many describe their youth as harsh and poor. Originally from Upper Egypt, the girls moved to Khafri al-Zayat with their mother, who was a petty criminal. Without a father and an unemployed older brother, it was a sister's job to produce an income. At the time, the only available positions were tenant farmers, domestic laborers, or factory workers. With limitations and brutal working conditions, the girls instead stole and went into prostitution. What became of their mother and brother isn't known, but Sakina and Raya continued their family business. Working in a brothel, Sakina met Abdul Al. They soon eloped and moved to Alexandria in 1919. Raya, meanwhile, mourned a husband and then married another. Hasabala was a thief and hashish smuggler, as well as the brother of Raya's former husband. The pair birthed a daughter, Badi'ia. Together they were caught by local authorities for unknown crimes and banished from Khafri al-Zayat and moved to Alexandria with Sakina. The family of four opened a series of brothels. One was nicknamed the camp because of its proximity to British soldiers. Two were near mosques, another in the Al-Yuni district and another in the Labian Bakery. To ensure a smooth operation, the family employed Arobi Hassan. 
Irobi's job was equivalent to a bodyguard. He'd force those to pay if they refused and protected the family from harm. Later, Abdul Razak would join the business. There were regulations on prostitution since 1882, which required sex workers to apply for licenses, pay taxes, and undergo weekly medical examinations. This method wasn't a fan favorite, as many women preferred the clandestine trade. The women that worked for Ryan Sakin were bourgeois and married, ranging from 17 to 50, therefore maintaining their public respectability while gaining extra money on the side. These workers were not employed by the family, so the sisters were only entitled to half the money their workers received from each client. After World War I, a decline in clients led sex workers to look elsewhere for employment. To keep their businesses afloat, the sisters hired poor teenage girls. The family provided clothing and jewelry to attract their clientele, indebting the young girls to them until they could pay for the goods. One essay further stated that the family enlisted in a trafficking network that sold teenage girls from southern Egypt to register brothels around the country. It goes on to say that this business model made previous sex workers undesirable as well as a threat. This control over sex workers, according to the essay, is the primary motivation for the following murders. The first victim was Raya's neighbor, Hanum. Conflicting stories describe how and why she was murdered. One source claims it was Raya's jealousy of the young woman's new jewelry that sparked her death. It goes on to state that Raya brought in her sister, who witnessed her husband and brother-in-law, along with her two hired protection digging a grave. Seeing Hanum's lifeless body, Sakina tried to run, but Raya threatened her by giving her a share of the woman's items, amounting to three Egyptian pounds. Yet another source finds Sakina the mastermind of the first kill, with her allegedly stating, I myself have cut the throats of six women. My first victim was Hanum. I leaned over her as if to whisper in her ear. Soon after, death had passed. Sakina would go on to describe her victims in this fashion, planting herself as the ringleader of the gang. As little by little women began to vanish, little attention was brought forth by authorities. The first missing person reported was 25-year-old Nasla Abu Alau. Her mother described her as wearing gold wristlets, a silver anklet, gold earrings, and two gold rings when she went missing. Next was Zanaba, who reportedly went to the market to meet Raya and never returned. Then a report of a mother by her 15-year-old daughter, followed by 50-year-old Fatma Abd Rabu, reported by her husband. She had 54 pounds on her, a couple of gold bracelets, and a pair of earrings. A Sudanese woman then reported her daughter, Fardus, missing, stating her wearing 60 pounds worth of jewelry, gold bracelets costing 35 pounds, earrings, and a gold necklace. Her report coincided with a building owner discovering a skull and remains of a woman while clearing drainage beneath his home. Some reports state the remains were found in a makeshift grave, while others say that hair and a bone were found near the home prior to the discovery of the young woman's remains. Sakina, a previous tenant of the building and frequent associate with the few of the missing women, were arrested, but dodged involvement during her interrogation. That's how the investigation progressed for some time. Not to mention that authorities didn't really suspect Sakina or Raya because of the cause of death the remains revealed. The young woman suffocated, and women just didn't kill in this fashion. They killed husbands, usually by poisoning, therefore the murderer had to be a man. Well, they were half right. The family, that now included their protection Yorobi and Abdul, worked together to commit each murder. Raya would go to the market where she'd find the woman wearing the most jewelry. They'd embark in conversation where Raya would declare that she had wares for a cheaper price at her home. The two would then go back to Raya's home where Raya would give the woman a drug-laced drink. Hasabala would then hold a towel over the victim's face to suffocate her. Abdul Al would hold her feet. Yorobi and Abdul would hold the victim's hands behind her back. Or Raya and Sakina held other parts of her down. For close to a year, this method proved beneficial, but their constant appearances on reports and strong scented homes raised suspicions. An undercover officer noted strong incense encompassing Raya's home. When he inquired about it, she explained that it was to hide the smell of alcohol and cigarettes from her brothel. Worry, the officer informed the police commissioner. Under the guise of a routine check, the commissioner visited Raya's home, noticing newer floor tiles in between older ones. He ordered them to be removed and was met with a foul odor. 
Arranging for the floor to be dug up, they soon discover the corpses of two women and remains of a third, which happened to be Fardos, one of the many women reported missing. Obtaining search warrants, authorities went from houses rented by the sisters, unearthing 17 corpses. Seven couldn't be identified, suggesting they may have been prostitutes or runaways. Despite their discoveries, Sakina wasn't one to admit defeat. Raya allegedly broke down quickly during her confession, trying to persuade the charge away from her husband. Her daughter, allegedly, insisted Sakina was the murderer, though other outlets suggest Raya's daughter actually pointed fingers at everyone. Still, Sakina refused to admit that she was involved for some time, but that's when witnesses began to come forward. One woman described as the lady living at 5 Makorobus Street stated that two months prior to the investigation, she'd seen Hasabala and Abdul Al entering Sakina's room with Zanaba, one of the missing women. She says they began to drink, and then near dawn, she heard a scream. When she talked to Sakina about it, the young woman described it as nothing. The same witness says a similar occurrence happened six weeks later, this time with Fatma. Once again, the screams came, and once more, she asked Sakina, who dodged the question. The brutality and overall shock value of the crimes created a frenzy in Egypt, and it continued to grow as the newspapers cast the women and their gang as if animals in a zoo. Imagery of the buildings, the bodies were discovered, and the bodies themselves were instructed by the public prosecutor to be featured in the Al Aram newspaper, a possible first for Egypt. Literacy critic Abbas Mahmoud El Aquad described the picture saying, the ugliness of evil and the effects of addiction are more pronounced in the faces of the women than the men. Perhaps it was the evilness in their eyes that caused commotion on whether or not the women should receive the death penalty. According to public prosecutor Salomon Azat, there were two reasons women hadn't been sentenced to death. One, their crimes demanded an element of mercy and compassion, and two, their sentencing was public. Yet, after a three-day trial, 31 witnesses, and four failed defense lawyers, Chief Magistrate Ahmed Mech Massa issued the death sentence on May 16, 1921 against Raya, Sakina, Hasabala, Abdul Al, Arubi, and Abdul Razak. Goldsmith Ali Muhammad Hassan, who purchased jewelry from the gang, received five years. Raya's daughter, Badaya, was placed in the orphanage. She died a few years later. These historic crimes transcended many miniseries, films, and plays all similarly named Raya and Sakina. Motivation for the crimes are debatable. Whether they did it for greed or rivalry, we may never know, but they were not the only killers during this time. In Tanta, in 1920, Mahmoud Alam was charged with conspiracy with his wife and another female to murder women and prostitutes in order to steal their jewelry. Alam was sentenced to death later that year. Under the guise of war, Raya and Sakina committed what they considered the perfect crime. Yet, nothing is perfect. I'm Mrs. True Crime, and remember to be kind, be loud, be aware. For more information about Raya and Sakina, why not check out some of these awesome links? And if you like what you saw and heard today, why not drop a like and a comment? Maybe subscribe while you're here? <laughs> I make new videos every Wednesday, and you don't want to miss what's in store.